Uh, thank you so much for being here. I say this more. I say good morning because I'm in San Francisco, where it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning. I know it's the afternoon for many of you in Europe, and even later for those of you uh, in Asia and Australia. Thank you so much for being here today. We have a wonderful panel uh, on a very important topic. The uh, airline industry has been going through, obviously, uh, a very difficult period of time uh, with COVID and with the financial uh, impacts of COVID. Um, and we're going to be exploring those issues today. We have an, a panel of experts who work in, in the area um, and we are a very international panel today. We have participants from Germany and Italy and the United States and France uh, and Greece. And so um, thank you for joining us. I also want to mention very quickly, as all of you know, uh, UIA has been continuing with a very uh, active set of webinars over the past couple of months. We'll continue that during the next, uh, the next months as well. We're also organizing a series of special events. We're going to be having a women's bar leaders set of events in September in our three official languages, one in Spanish, one in French, one in English. And we're working already on our virtual Congress at the end of October, which promises to be just an extraordinary set of uh, meetings and events. To be frank, the fact that we will be virg virtual uh, while it presents some limitations also presents some opportunities we haven't had in the past. And we're, we're planning some things we have not done before. Um, and we're very excited about what's coming in October. So uh, I hope I will see all of you there. And then of course, next year we will be in Guadalajara, Mexico in 2021. And after that in uh, Dakar, uh, and then be after that in Paris and probably Vienna. So those are all things to come. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our uh, moderators. Uh, mm -hmm. We have Alberto Pasino who will be taking the, the mic now, and then Paolo Lombardo, who will be uh, the moderator today. So I will click off my screen, but I just wanted to thank all of you for being here, for working with us, and for keeping UIA so vibrant and active. Thank you very much. And Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, my war warmest greetings to all par participants to this webinar. I am Alberto Pasino, partner of Dunarelli, a full-service law firm with offices in nine cities in Italy and abroad, and four lawyers. I practice maritime and transport law in Trieste. Today, I will co-moderate with this mm -hmm. webinar, which has been organized by the Transport Law Commission and by the Private International Law Commission of the UIA. I will share this pleasant task with Paolo Lombardi, chair of this latter commission. I would first like to briefly introduce our speakers to you before we get started. Our first speaker will be Olaf Hartenstein, partner of Arnecke Siebert Staberstein, a commercial law firm with offices in six cities in Germany and 160 lawyers. Mr. Hartenstein is based in Hamburg, where he advises clients in international commercial and transport law, maritime and inland waterway navigation law, insurance law, international and European civil procedural law and arbitration. He has been <laughs> lecturing at the Paris Institute of Comparative Law, holds a diploma d'études approfondies from the Sorbonne and a master degree from ACES. Besides being an active member of the German International Maritime Law Association and of several other maritime and transport law related associations, he has been a much appreciated president of the UIA Transport Law Commission from 2014 to 2019. <clears throat> the second speaker will be Sébastien Goulet, partner of Favarelle Associé, a law firm which was founded in Marseille in 2005 and which assists several shipyards based in the Mediterranean area as well as some airline companies. Lawyers since 2004. Sebastian is specialized in international transaction and litigation. His activity is directly linked with maritime law, shipping, and aviation law. We will then have a presentation from Rachel Welford, an aviation regulatory at Cousin O'Connor, a full service law firm with 30 offices and more than 750 lawyers around the US and abroad. 
Rachel is based in Washington, D.C., and she brings substantial capabilities to clients in the area of aviation law and policy involving U.S. government agency. She also represents airlines, airports, and other regulated entities before the Transportation Security Administration of the U.S. on aviation security issues. After Rachel, Christopher Kennedy will have the floor. Like Rachel, also Christopher works at Cozen O'Connor, focusing his practice on international insurance, reinsurance, aviation, and marine matters. Mr. Kende is a member of the Aeronautics Committee of the New York City Bar and a former member of the Foreign and Comparative Law Committee of that organization. He is past president of the Maritime Law Committee of the New York Country Lawyers Association. After having been the president of the UIA Transport Law Commission, Christopher is the current president of the Insurance Law Commission of the UIA and serves on the international organization, conventions, and standard committee of the Maritime Law Association of the U.S. Mm -hmm. He is an adjunct professor of transportation and maritime law at Brooklyn Law School. Our last speaker will be Mara Stigliano partner of the Greek law firm Stiliano and Stiliano. She is specialized in international corporate, maritime and aviation law, and acts as lawyer for international maritime companies, insurers of international aviation company and airlines in cases of both Greek and foreign jurisdiction. After her speech, we will be glad to take on questions. Please type yours in the relevant box, specifying the speaker to whom it is addressed. At the end of the webinar, during the Q&A session, we will try to address them. And now just a few words to introduce the topic. COVID-19 is affecting all aspects of our daily lives. There is not a single industry that has not been hit by the pandemic. Through its webinars, YA is making continuous efforts to make its contribution to a better understanding of the legal consequence of this new play. We have decided to focus on the impact of COVID-19 on the air transportation industry and the rights of passengers and shippers, <coughs> which have been severely impacted by the pandemic, resulting in a fly cancellation policy adopt adopted by the vast majority of air carriers. From a substantive point of view, there are regulatory issues, there are questions as regards the possibility for freight carriers to claim force majeure in case of failure to deliver cargo. A similar question might be raised with concern to passenger carriers, which are already suffering class actions related to the, their cancellation policy. In spite of the fact that European rules give air carriers the option to offer vouchers to passengers in case of cancellation of flight, several air carriers are offering vouchers as the only compensation, and the legitimacy of such behavior is largely questioned, with class actions already in the pipeline in several jurisdictions. The fact that some countries have passed legislatures which offer the option of vouchers by carriers also have very significant ramifications in private international law. Isn't it, Paolo? Uh, yes, Alberto, thank you. And uh, first of all, uh, hello, dear colleagues, uh, and uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm very happy to be here today and to moderate uh, this webinar with Alberto. As uh, Alberto said before, today we will uh, deal with the cancellation of flights uh, due to the current uh, pandemic. Uh, I think uh, it is a very hot topic. Uh, in my opinion, it is very interesting both uh, for our daily professional activities uh, and uh, why not uh, even for our personal life. Uh, some countries uh, have uh, restricted uh, free movement uh, for persons uh, coming from areas uh, affected by COVID. And uh, as far as I know, for instance, uh, for a certain period, uh, Austria did not allow people coming from Italy into its territory 
while uh, the US, for example, have uh, just banned the travels uh, from Europe, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, flights have been cancelled. And moreover, some countries uh, like Italy, for example, have uh, adopted the specific legislation that include self-proclaimed overriding mandatory provisions stating that obligations arising from transport contracts concluded by persons affected by COVID are to be considered as impossible and establishing a specific procedure for obtaining the reimbursement of the price paid under the transport contract. And as a consequence, uh, these uh, involves uh, for sure some issues uh, concerning uh, applicable law. Uh, so, in other words, uh, the law governing uh, those uh, transport contracts, uh, and in particular from a private international law perspective, in my opinion, a tricky question is to assess whether the rules uh, banning travels uh, have really to be considered uh, as uh, overriding uh, mandatory provisions or not, uh, and which are the consequences, uh, and uh, if uh, such rules uh, are really overriding mandatory provisions, uh, another interesting matter could be whether the dispositions uh, concerning jurisdiction have an impact uh, on this subject or not. So, in order to break uh, the ice, uh, now the idea is to introduce uh, in a very general way the substantial and the private international law issues uh, concerning our today's topic uh, that uh, will be further deeply discussed uh, by the sub subsequent speakers. Uh, this uh, task uh, is going now to be performed uh, by our colleague uh, Olaf Hartenstein from Hamburg, who is the immediate past president of the Transport Law Commission of the UIA and an active member of the Private International Law Commission as well. So, Olaf, many thanks for being here and please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you very much, Paolo, for having organized this and for this uh, kind introduction. So, yes, here it is. I will, as Paolo said, give you a brief introduction on the aspects of private international law on the issue of flight cancellations. Uh, and the focus really is on the private international law rules, meaning the applicable law rules. Um, my personal area of practice is transport law and all modes of transport, but as far as air carriage is concerned, I deal rather with the transport of goods than with the transport of passengers. Um, that is our special team in Frankfurt uh, who takes care of that. Um, uh, and uh, that is why I'm very happy to limit myself to the private international issues here. Um, of course, I had personal experiences with uh, flights being cancelled just uh, just yesterday. Actually, I was supposed to go to a uh, to a court hearing in Munich and eventually had to go by train, which is a long ride. But no private international law issues there. So uh, here comes my little presentation. Uh, as already mentioned. The restrictions of um, COVID-19 uh, imposed by all countries uh, place a heavy burden on all companies and particularly airlines. Uh, different nations introduced varying legislative measures to safeguard economic interests uh, at the business and the consumer level and particularly also travel bans and quarantine rules. For the airline traffic, passenger market, it nearly it meant nearly the cancellation of all flights. In that context, some countries restricted the free movement for persons coming from areas affected by the coronavirus and the consequences of uh, flight cancellations. Uh, for example, and these are only some examples, the US banned travels from Europe Germany stopped uh, the entry of passengers from certain countries, Austria uh, for people coming from Italy. And that changes 
uh, and changed all the time. So um, uh, being loosened and uh, becoming stricter again and being loosened again. In any event, governance established different and uh, various rules uh, on how to reimburse the price paid as part of the translation uh, contract or other domestic substantive law rules, um, all you can imagine. Some only have an indirect, um, an indirect effect on the transportation contracts, but some con uh, concern the uh, transportation uh, contract uh, directly. And I, of course, here speak of the rules that concern the transportation contract directly. When you read these rules, it would seem that such provisions are always meant to apply generally to all contracts, irrespective of the applicable law. But whether that is really so is, of course, a question of private international law. And what I intend to do here is just give you a very brief overview on how uh, the system of European uh, private international law works on this um, to get an idea where we have to start checking the question. So the applicable law uh, within the European Union uh, is generally governed by the so-called Rome 1 regulation of 17th June 2008. Um, and that regulation says which law is applicable to a certain contract. Uh, there's a general um, freedom of choice rule in Article 3, the freedom of choice uh, for passenger uh, uh, carriage contracts is a little restricted in Article 5. Basically, um, an airline and a passenger can uh, choose the law applicable, but only between four different or four or five different laws, which is basically the law of the airline, the law of the passenger, uh, the law of the place of departure or of destination. If there is no choice, uh, then there is also a rule that is Article 5, uh, and under Article 5, the law applicable to a transportation contract is um, basically the, the law of the country where the habitual residence of the passenger is, under the condition that there is also the place of departure or the place of destination in that country. And if that is not the case, then it's the place, uh, the law of the place where the carrier has its habitual residence. So. The, the interesting questions here, I think, are one, which impact does substantive European legislation have on these rules? And the second question is, which impact do mandatory domestic rules of a particular state have on this? And now we will go through these two questions quickly. The first one is, which impact does substantive European legislation have on the conflict of law rule I just described. Well, it is in the Rome 1 regulation as well. Article 23 of that regulation expressly says, with the exception of Article 7, which is, uh, uh, which is here not of interest that uh, regards insurance, um, this regulation shall not prejudice the application of provisions of community law, which in relation to particular matters, lay down conflict of law rules relating to contractual obligations. Now, there is uh, another European regulation, the so-called EU passenger rights regulation. Uh, and you can ask yourself, does that regulation fall under this Article 23? The, EU, uh, the, the EU passenger rights regulation is actually a regulation containing substantive law rules. For example, on denied boarding, cancellation of flights, delay of flights, uh, and for such um, cases provides for certain rights of the passengers. Um, and you could now discuss, is that a regulation in the sense of Article 23, Rome 1 de regulation, which, um, which would be a provision of community law in relation to a particular matter? Yes, air passenger transportation lay down conflict of law rules relating to contractual obligations. Does this regulation on passenger rights lay down conflict of law rules? Um, 
on a first glance, you would say, no, it's not conflict of law rules, it's, it's substantive law rules. And there is actually quite a dispute on a parallel situation with international conventions more generally. And that is a um, point of view often taken. I, I think I uh, am of the opposite opinion. This regulation does fall under the definition uh, because uh, the substantial rules, the uh, substantive law uh, provided by this regulation applies only in certain circumstances. And that is the area of application of these, uh, this regulation defined in Article 3. It applies uh, basically to all flights departing uh, from a country of the European Union or from Switzerland, Norway or Iceland, regardless of the operating airline and regardless where to it goes. Any flights departing from the EU, uh, uh, this regulation applies. Second, it applies also um, to any flights operated by a European airline uh, with a destination airport in one of the European states, regardless from where the flight started. So taking this together, you can see that the regulation does not apply um, if you have an airline from a third country um, and a departure in a third country landing in Europe, uh, then the regulation does not apply. And then there's a, another particular rule. I won't uh, go into details here. So when you see this, uh, it's um, a definition of the um, application of the applicability of the regulation. But what it really is, is um, a conflict of law rule. This regulation applies if the conditions I've just explained are met or not. Uh, and by this, I would say it is a conflict of law rule in the regulation, so that this regulation falls under Article 23, Rome 1 regulation. Um, it is also the only solution I can see to um, reconcile the two regulations, because otherwise there's no other rule how you could, how you could deal with it. I only say it so uh, extensively because there are uh, indeed other uh, views on this. So if you have an issue uh, which is uh, ruled uh, by the regulation on passenger rights, then the, uh, this regulation um, applies in its um, uh, uh, domain of applicability and you do not even come to Rome 1. And I will quickly just very quickly say what is in that uh, passenger rights regulation um, certain rights of passengers against the airline in case of denial of boarding cancellation or delay um, such rights may include compensation or reimbursement of the flight or alternative uh, transport or uh, certain services like uh, meals refreshments accommodation and so on there's an important exception uh, and that is uh, important uh, why does this? Ah, yeah. Um, the compensation is not due if the air carrier can prove beyond doubt that extraordinary circumstances occurred and the flight cancellation could not have been avoided by reasonable measures. That is something you can certainly discuss for the COVID 19. There's no case law yet, as far as I can see, um, but that is uh, likely, um, likely the case uh, of the pandemic. Okay. Uh, there's another issue. There are some interpretative guidelines to this regulation of passenger rights uh, issued by the European Commission in March 2020. Um, and uh, that particularly concerns the, um, uh, the issue mentioned by you, Alberto. Uh, is, the, um, is the airline allowed to uh, just give a voucher to the passenger after the cancellation mm. of the flight, or does it need to pay? Uh, Germany and other governments uh, seeing the uh, uh, difficulties of the airline companies said, okay, it, sh it should be in order to uh, just give a voucher. But uh, the European Commission, uh, and I guess probably uh, for a good reason and rightly said, no, the regulation says payment. And uh, so, uh, that uh, is not in the um, regulation itself. And the regulation it simply says payment. 
uh, and it doesn't even mention the voucher, but this um, interpretation uh, explicitly excluding the voucher solution is not in the regulation, it's in the guidelines given by the Commission. All right, so we come to the second question, uh, which impact do mandatory domestic rules of a particular state have uh, on the law otherwise applicable on the basis of the Rome 1 regulation? And that is uh, Article 9 of the Rome 1 regulation. Uh, there are certain so-called overriding mandatory provisions. They are defined as provisions, uh, the respect for which is regarded as crucial by a certain country for safeguarding its public interests, such as political, social, or economic organization, to such extent that they are applicable to any situation within their scope, irrespective of the law otherwise applicable. If a, a judge uh, is in front of uh, a foreign law applicable to a contract he has, on he has to decide on, that judge can check whether there are mandatory provisions of his own um, of his own uh, law, uh, and then, if so, apply them instead of the otherwise applicable law. If that is not the case, then there is still the possibility that the judge says, oh, um, we don't have mandatory provisions, but in the country where the contract is to be performed, there are uh, mandatory provisions, and if it is performed there against these provisions, then that performance is unlawful. In that case, the judge can, it doesn't say apply, it uh, says uh, take uh, into consideration uh, these mandatory provisions of a third country. These are the rules of the Rome 1 regulation and the question now is, of course, what does that mean, overriding mandatory provisions? Mm. And what, uh, what happens if you identify them? If you have a, a rule uh, edited by one of the legislators uh, on the basis of the COVID-19 um, situation, um, and you identify that rule as a overriding mandatory provisions, then as just explained, that would in principle allow uh, the judge to deviate from the law otherwise applicable. If it is not Oh, sorry, either in, the, in favor of the court's own mandatory rules or in favor of the mandatory rules of the place of performance. If the uh, rule is not a mandatory um, overriding, uh, overriding mandatory provision, then only the rules of the law indicated by Article 3 and or 5 of the Rome Regulation shall apply, and not that otherwise mandatory uh, law. So, the qualification as overriding mandatory rule must meet the requirements of Article 9. And how is that, um, how is that uh, made sure? And who decides whether a certain provision is an overriding mandatory provision? Uh, the domestic courts have a certain range of discretion, uh, and so does the domestic legislator beforehand. Uh, the legislator can say uh, this law I'm just making is uh, particularly important and crucial for our uh, public interests, political, social, or economic. And then the court um, has some discretion to say whether that is uh, really the case or not. But the framework for this, uh, that is set by the European Court of Justice and by uh, European uh, community law. Uh, that defines the frame for this discretion. Um, there's, for example, the decision Unamar of 2013, uh, where uh, the matter was uh, discussed. There was a case in um, state agency law, uh, and the Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice, stated as follows It must be ensured that the choice freely made by the parties is respected so that the plea relating to the existence of a mandatory rule within the meaning of the legislation of the member state concerned must be interpreted strictly. That means the countries shouldn't just say any legislation we make is uh, crucial, otherwise we wouldn't make it, so uh, always simply apply their own law. No, um, there is legislation and there is really crucial legislation and what is really crucial must be interpreted in a very strict and narrow sense. 
Second, uh, this is still a quotation of that judgment. It is for the national court to take account not only of the exact terms of that law, does the law itself say uh, that it is crucial, uh, but also of its general structure and of all the circumstances uh, in which that law was adopted. So the, the European Court of Justice really requests the, um, uh, the national courts uh, to, uh, to check very uh, intensively whether there is really uh, uh, an overriding mandatory uh, rule in that sense. This is a slow reaction. So um, there's no general answer to this in respect of the COVID-19 legislation, of course. What you have to look at first is, does a certain rule uh, or legislative provision uh, under the COVID-19 um, legislation um, really affect the contract itself, or is it only an indirect uh, effect on that contract? If it is a direct effect, then um, please uh, check whether uh, that is really so crucial. And in case of the COVID-19 problem, most rules are, but it is also, uh, sorry, it is always um, a, a question on the particular provision and the particular case. Summarizing this, first, uh, first uh, level uh, of applicable law is uh, from a European perspective, the passenger's rights regulation is the issue covered by that regulation and does it fall into the uh, applicability scope of that uh, regulation? If so, you apply it. You don't even come to Rome 1 and the questions we just discussed. If not, you come to Rome 1 and you have to choose the applicable law and then you can see whether there are any um, crucial mandatory rules that need to re be respected. And that must be interpreted very narrowly. That is it. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf, for your interesting speech. Uh, and uh, again, uh, as uh, Alberto said uh, at the beginning of this webinar, uh, any questions for uh, Olaf, uh, Please uh, wait uh, for the end of this webinar. There will be a special section for uh, Q&A. And so uh, the idea is now to continue with uh, our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Sébastien Goulet uh, from uh, Marseille, uh, from France. So, uh, bonjour Sébastien, uh, many thanks uh, for being here, and please, uh, the, the, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to, to speak uh, this afternoon, uh, this afternoon in France, uh, to speak about um, the French law perspective concerning the cancellation of flights due to COVID-19, uh, but more especially concerning the, the freight contracts. Um, indeed, um, sorry, I, I will take my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, here we go. Uh, yes, indeed. So, uh, due to the lockdown rules, uh, these rules led to the closing of, uh, as you know, for the national borders. And the main aim of this measure was, of course, to stop uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. But, uh, of course, it has also had a direct impacts on the all the travel sector, especially on the air transport, resulting in cancellation of flights. Uh, there are two situations, of course, uh, that has to be dealt, the airlines company which carry freight and the airlines company which carry passengers. Uh, today I will focus on the first uh, issue uh, and my colleague will deal uh, with the, the, the second one, the carriage of uh, passengers. Um, sorry. Um, yes, sorry for that. So, uh, what is the impact of force measure on freight contracts? 
some airlines company have been able to uh, perform have not been able to perform some freight contracts for instance the delivery of parcels uh, as the freighter has to stop its activity uh, the question is therefore the following may the covid 19 be considered as a first major event uh, under French law, uh, it is the Article 1218 of the Civil Code which defines the first major and defines the event of first major, and there are three uh, elements which must be fulfilled. First of all, it must be out of the control of the debtor who claims it. Uh, secondly, it could, not have, it could not have been reasonably foreseen when the contract was executed, that is to say that it was unpredictable. And the last condition is that the effects of this event cannot be avoided by, the, by any appropriate measures. That is to, be, that is to say that e, the event has to be uh, finally irresistible. Um, therefore, can the COVID-19 be considered as a force major situation? In fact, the uh, answer to this question is not obvious. Uh, uh, I will uh, speak about few decisions which have been rendered in the past, not concerning the COVID-19, but concerning other epidemics like uh, the H1N1 uh, disease or the dengue virus or uh, also the chikungunya um, uh, disease in uh, French Guiana in the next, near the, the West Indies. And in this uh, kind of, um, of events, uh, the judge considered that these, the diseases were sufficiently known as well as the risk uh, of spread and effects on the health. Uh, or uh, on other decisions, they say that uh, they were not left little enough to constitute a force majeure event. Therefore, the qualification of force majeure in this situation has been rejected. There are two decisions there of the Court of Appeal. Uh, of one of Besançon in uh, 2014 and the other one uh, from the Court of Appeal of Bastia in the West Indies in 2018. Um, therefore, can the COVID-19, how it would be different from this uh, precedent? Um, in fact, um, uh, we can say that, sorry, I got an issue with... Uh, I don't manage to put my slide. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, yes, how, how is the COVID-19 is different from the other disease? In fact, the yes, it is different because in this situation, there is first of all a statement from the, from the uh, um, World uh, Health Organization uh, from the January 13, which says that it is public health emergency of international concerns. Uh, to come back to France, on the, at the end of February, our French Minister of Economics, Mr. Bruno Lomer, uh, said that COVID-19 is an event of force majeure for companies, especially in state public procurements. And there are some, also this kind of statement which has been taken by the Indian government and also uh, by the Chinese Council for the promotion of international trade. Uh, international, international trade. So we can see that it's it is different and as it uh, due to uh, it is really um, a situation which um, concerns the world entirely. Um, in other fields than commercial contracts, French courts have already recognized the risk of coronavirus related um, pandemic and the sex subsequent lockdown measures as a case of force majeure. There are already two decisions to date which have been rendered. The first of all is a decision from the Court of Appeal of Douai on March 2020, and another one uh, by the Court d'Affaires of Colmar on uh, March uh, 2020, but it was on a, a criminal matter concerning and also concerning uh, foreigners' rights. And this suggests that the future position of different jurisdictions in regards with the commercial contracts. Uh, application of a force majeure to the COVID-19 uh, situation. So the three elements, the first uh, must be met, and even beyond the debtor's control. Uh, let's say that considering the uh, considered by the WHO as a public health emergency of international concern, then the pandemic and or subsequent state measures, travel uh, restriction, closure of establishment, lockdown, etc., the COVID-19 could be considered as fulfilling this condition. 
What about the second condition? An event that could not have been reasonably foreseen at the time of a conclusion of a contract. As COVID-19 is a new form of virus uh, for which no vaccine currently exists, this condition will is in, will in likelihood be met for all contracts entered, renewed, extended before January 2020. Uh, this situation seems to be distinguishable from the one submitted to the Baster Court of, Court, Court of Appeal that I uh, dealt with previously concerning the dengue fever or the chinkugunya, uh, because uh, this, uh, let's say that this, in this situation, the disease had been well uh, uh, widely announced and anticipated. What about the third condition, an event preventing the performance on obligation and the effect of which cannot be avoided by appropriate measures. COVID-19 has in fact proven to have potentially less consequences and has led to an unprecedented series of restrictive measures, limiting movements, imposing lockdown and shutdown of the establishment as well as, well as border. So this third situation seems also to be met. Um, under French law, uh, the legal rules relating to force majeure are not of public order nature, and the parties may freely delimit the content of the obligation and the force majeure clause, which would be applicable to them during the performance of a contract. Of course, most business contracts thus give a broader definition of a force majeure than the one usually used by the court and designate the event considered as force majeure. Um, of course, the judge will respect this contractual freedom that allows the party to foresee the effects that the force majeure will have on the contract. There is an example of a force majeure clause. Uh, I, I will uh, give my presentation available for everyone. So if, one, if somebody wants to do this with it, it's not a problem. But maybe it's not useful to, to read it now. Um, and now concerning the possibility to invoke the force majeure clause for COVID-19 related situation, the time, in fact, what is crucial, it is the time of a contract. Um, and the contract concluded after or renewed after the breakout of the virus in Europe will not be submitted to the same regime, of course, as the one entered after. What are the consequences uh, in case of force majeure? Regardless of the duration of the event of force majeure, it has, to, it has the effect of discharging the debtor who is unable to perform its obligation. Uh, if the impossibility to perform the contractual obligation is only temporary, the performance of a contract in question is, will only be suspended without any li liability on the part of a debtor or in other words, obligations which cannot be performed will be postponed and will have to be performed as soon as the situation allows it. On the other hand, in case of permanent impairment, the contract will be terminated as of right without the debt of liability being engaged and the parties will have the right to claim restitution of contractual consideration already performed. Now let's deal with the practical application on the charter contract. Uh, it is possible that a charter contract provides a force majeure clause exonerating the party in case of lack of performance of a contract obligation due to a force majeure event, uh, even if the suspension of a contract is uh, that the case provided by the contract. Uh, in some cases, the party discussed the possibility to raise this force majeure clause, but finally found a settlement agreement in order to save the contract. To be more precise, in our firm uh, during uh, the month of April, we have been confronted with such a situation between a courier company and a carrier. Uh, for more than two months, the mail could not be delivered. The first major clause, which was provided by the contract, in fact, it's the one that I mentioned previously, uh, was invoked, but the party finally reached uh, an, a gentleman. I got an issue with my laptop. Colette, maybe you could put the next slide. Uh, 
Um, yes. Um, Uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna finish my presentation with two concrete examples: uh, Seba Logistic and DHF Global Forwarding. I'm sorry, my presentation does not work anymore. Uh, okay, let's continue. Both both this company, Seba Logistic and DHF Global Forwarding, have announced force major action to their carriers and logistics service customers. Uh, they, are only, they are the only ones who have made their position public on that point. For example, BDP International, one of the world's leading company uh, privately held freight transportation management firms, said that they rather focus on finding the best solution for their customers through mutual bilateral discussion. Um, on the other side, Seba Logistics, a uh, company owed by the container carrier C CMA CGM, said that it, it reserved the right to modify all or parts of its services to change its working procedure and any previously agreed rates and prices to levise such surcharges, or otherwise to take any measures necessary to adjust its business operation and its obligation to its customer, suppliers, and other stakeholders in response to the prevailing circumstances. Uh, DHL Global Forwarding said that, for its part, that all almost elements of a hair and ocean supply chain on certain trade lanes currently being impossible to predict or control that decided to declare force majeure and to reserve the right to modify the services to the prevailing circumstances consequent to this coronavirus. Um, in fact, we must be very careful on that point because DHL or SEVA decision do not mean that all customers will be affected nor affected equally. Uh, it also doesn't mean that DHL or SEVA customer can back out, they can back out uh, of their contract despite altered circumstances. Uh, customers' rights will depend finally on the language of the contract, the applicable law and the specificity of this disruption. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastien, uh, for uh, your presentation and for having given to us uh, the French uh, perspective uh, on this matter. And now let's move uh, to the US uh, because uh, our next next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Rachel uh, Welford from uh, Washington, D.C. So many thanks, uh, Rachel, for being here. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Good morning from the US. Good afternoon to everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. If we can click one more slide, please. <clears throat> So today I'm going to provide you with an overview of the U.S. Department of Transportation in the United States, or DOT, their regulations when it comes to airline refunds. Today we're going to specifically cover two topics. First, when must airlines provide a refund under DOT regulations? And second, <clears throat> how does DOT compliance relate to uh, many class actions that have been filed in the United States, which my colleague Chris Kendi will uh, provide more detail on after my presentation. So let's start with the first question. First, what does DOT require, the Department of Transportation? And I'll use the uh, abbreviation DOT just to save the mouthful every time I say DOT. Um, let's talk about who the requirements apply to first. Um, US and foreign airlines, as well as ticket agents. What must airlines and ticket agents do? They must provide a refund option if a flight is canceled or significantly delayed. And you can see uh, significantly delayed in quotations. We're gonna talk about what that means and, and what cancellation means. Um, and the passenger does not accept the alternative offered by the airline. When must they provide the refund? Promptly. And again, we'll talk about what promptly means. Before we talk about some of the uh, issues with, with um, providing refunds, 
what does DOT allow? So it is permitted to issue a passenger a voucher or a credit in certain cases, but there are conditions. First, um, the passenger must elect the voucher or credit, um, and the option of a refund must be offered and very clearly disclosed to the consumer that they're entitled to a refund. And second, any restrictions that might accompany that voucher, like the period in which it must be used or any fees that might be deducted from the credit must also be clearly disclosed. If those things happen and a passenger accepts a voucher and they're due a refund, that's okay. However, if an airline by either misrepresentation or omission doesn't quite tell the consumer um, these, these elements of, of receiving a voucher and misleads consumers about their right to a refund or the value of the credit that they've accepted, DOT may deem that conduct to be in violation of uh, their rules. Um, note that refusal of an airline to refund a ticket or provide a voucher for a non-refundable ticket uh, for flights to from within the United States that is still being operated, meaning not canceled, without a significant change is permitted. And I'll note that it does not matter if the delay or cancellation is due to factors outside of the airline's control, including due to government restrictions that have resulted as a uh, post or in the middle of COVID. If the cancellation is through no faults of the passenger, the passenger is due a refund. DOT is not backing off this expectation in light of COVID-19 um, and, and instead is, is taking a very close look at this issue as I'll talk about in uh, subsequent slides. Before we go to the next slide, <clears throat> a word about DOT's legal authority in this area. DOT has broad authority under 49 USC 41712 under a statute to take action when an airline engages in quote an unfair uh, or deceptive practice or an unfair method of competition. If they find an airline engages in that sort of conduct, they can order that the airline stop that conduct and they can also assess a civil penalty. DOT has not adopted regulations specifically addressing the question of when an airline must provide a passenger with a refund, which has led to some uh, challenges. Um, DOT has regulated, um, it meaning issued regulations on the uh, issue of prompt and what prompt means, but not quite, um, not quite to the level of detail that maybe um, would avoid some of the confusion that's coming out uh, lately. However, due to its broad authority under 41712, even though DOT does not have any regulations specifically addressing airline refunds, they still could enforce against airlines for a failure to provide a refund if they can show the conduct was unfair or deceptive. Unfair either in its own right as a practice or deceptive where the airline may be put out a statement or put something in the contract of carriage that led the passenger to believe they would get a refund, but the airline didn't give it to them. Indeed, the Department of Transportation has said in guidance that it considers it to be, quote, manifestly unfair for a carrier to fail to provide transportation that the passenger contracted for and then refuse to provide a refund when the passenger finds a rerouting unacceptable and instead wants their money back. Additionally, an important aspect of 41712, this gives DOT the authority to investigate and take action against airlines for this unfair or deceptive conduct, but there's no private right of action for the individual under 41712. All individuals can do is bring what's called a third party complaint to DOT saying, DOT, I want you to investigate this airline for conduct. DOT may decide to take up that invitation and conduct the investigation. And if DOT upholds the complaint, really the remedy is injunctive relief, where DOT tells the airline to stop engaging in that conduct um, and potentially a civil penalty, which could be quite significant. So let's break down these terms, significantly delayed, canceled, prompt. I mean, what do these terms mean? 
DOT has not defined these terms by statute or regulation. And interestingly, DOT said in guidance, which is not binding, that airlines may set reasonable interpretations of those terms. So airlines are given the discretion to say what is significantly delayed, what is canceled. However, whatever they say the airlines decide those terms mean, they must honor the definitions that they choose. And the implication here is that if DOT decides an airline's definitions are unreasonable, they could take action. So while there is some flexibility and leeway, DOT is closely looking at how airlines are defining these terms. Second point, how prompt is prompt? We have a bit more clarity here from DOT, but not much. Um, first, the, the requirement to provide a prompt refund if a refund is due um, for airlines applies to airlines and ticket agents. For airlines, a refund must be made within seven business days if you paid by credit card or 20 days if you paid by cash or check. That seems clearer. Uh, but for ticket agents, what constitutes prompt is not defined. That's just an open question. In terms of timeliness of refunds in light of COVID-19, I'm sure we've heard in the news and um, in the media that airlines are inundated with requests for refunds, and it's just hard to get through uh, the processing of those refunds in a timely manner due to volume. DOT recognizes this, but is still taking a close look at how airlines are processing these refunds. Specifically for airlines, they, DOT has said publicly we're gonna look at whether airlines are making good faith effort to provide refunds in a timely manner. And for ticket agents, they said, we're gonna look at whether um, the ticket agents are taking steps to increase the volume of these incoming requests. In both cases, as DOT assesses complaints related to refunds, DOT said they're looking at a quote, totality of the circumstances. Um, review of, of what they are seeing before them. <clears throat> a word on refundable tickets versus non-refundable tickets, because there's a little bit of confusion about this. First, we're really talking about non-refundable tickets here. If a ticket is refundable, the passengers generally do a refund. As for non-refundable tickets, again, the right to a refund really depends on whether the flight is operated, meaning not canceled, without a significant change. If there was no significant change or cancellation, again, generally speaking, airlines may just refuse to provide a refund or a voucher to the passenger. DOT specifically stated in guidance that this is true and permitted, even if the passenger wishes to change or cancel, due to concerns about COVID-19. Um, an important note though, is that DOT requires that airlines and ticket agents apply the refund policy in place at the time the passenger purchased their ticket. So they would consider it, likely consider it an unfair practice if the airlines and ticket agents would try to apply retroactively uh, new refund policies that would affect consumers negatively. <clears throat> However, let's say there was a significant change or cancellation, then you'd look to the airline contract of carriage, the airline passenger contract, to figure out how are those terms defined. Again, the airline sets its own definitions. If the definitions are unreasonable, DOT may step in and override that. But as you can tell, this analysis can become quite case specific, um, particularly if an airline's contract of carriage doesn't even address those terms or the language is vague or it's beyond what DOT might tolerate for regulatory uh, compliance purposes. So the real inquiry involves looking at an airline contract. It's not necessarily the case that one person's experience is identical to another person's experience because the contract could be different. It might have changed. Um, the core claim here, which Chris will, will discuss, my colleague Chris, is breach of contract. So the airlines, um, contract of carriage would obviously be involved. Again, if DOT takes issue with these definitions, there could be a regulatory compliance issue for the airline, but that may not necessarily assist with a plaintiff who is suing to recover a refund. Uh, but again, that, that depends on the case. 
So just leading into um, what my colleague will be speaking about, what, what do these regulations mean for uh, the many class actions that at least have been filed in the United States um, requesting um, or alleging breach of contract and breach of other claims or refusal to provide a refund? Um, as we know, DOT does not require refunds in all cases. So a statement that says an airline owes me a refund no matter what is not necessarily, is not necessarily true. Uh, second, DOT has issued guidance on the issuance of refunds, which I've mentioned in my presentation. Guidance is not binding. However, it's, it's a general, um, general insight into DOT's expectations and thinking on this issue. Third, DOT has not yet taken enforcement action, brought an investigation that resulted in a um, civil penalty for a COVID-related refund issue yet. We know that DOT ha has received a significant number of complaints. Um, apparently, according to DOT, um, in March and April, they re received 25,000 complaints related to airline refunds alone during those two months compared to 1,500 complaints in a typical month. Our expectation, therefore, is that DOT is devoting significant resources to looking at this, and they very well may take action against one or more airlines for a failure to provide a refund, which could result in a significant civil penalty. Uh, but the uh, DOT has not done so yet. But even if an airline is found to have violated DOT rules, and even if they pay a penalty, Again, that violation itself does not even provide a basis for recovery in private litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for your speech. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we, we, we have to say a little bit more in US because uh, the next speaker is uh, Christopher uh, Kende from uh, New York. And uh, Christopher is the current president of the Insurance Law Commission of the UIA, and he is a specialized in transport law as well. So many thanks, uh, Chris, uh, for being here today. And uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Rachel. And it is a pleasure to be participating in this webinar. Um, I'm very uh, impressed with the number of participants. It's over 80, uh, so um, I'll try to do the best job I can. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about litigation, following up on Rachel's uh, presentation, which I, I thought was extremely informative. Um, essentially, uh, as we all know, there was a virtual shutdown of the airline industry following the pandemic. Um, many airlines have been under significant uh, stress, uh, cash flow, and obviously would prefer to offer refund, uh, credits uh, with some incentives other than actually having to refund uh, payments. Uh, so many have tried to do that with incentives such as mileage, et cetera. Uh, but there are no, obviously, as, as Rachel mentioned, thousands of passengers would rather just get their money back. Um, so we have what I would call a tidal wave. I know that's a maritime term of lawsuits against airlines for uh, refunds. So my plan is to just go through some of the theories of liability under our US system and uh, focus on the substance of the claims. Many of these are class actions. The class action vehicle is a very unique vehicle to the U.S. I know that there have been evolution to the uh, concept in civil law countries. There's the, the what we call the recours collectif in France. I think it's only limited to um, consumer organizations. Um, the U.S.'s system is, is is much more open. I'll address it very briefly, but it's kind of a separate area of specialty. Um, so we'll move forward. There we go. Um, the legal framework is that there are a there's three very well known Supreme Court cases which govern the issue with respect to 
uh, how you can sue airlines and for what you can sue airlines. And just again, for our European uh, confrères and consoeurs, our system is very is different from civil law countries in that our courts can actually make law as well as interpret law, unlike most civil law countries, which are bound by the civil code. So we have statutes which are passed by the Congress, and then the US, uh, the US Supreme Court will elaborate and extend and interpret those statutes and will actually make law. So to some degree, this is the situation following what we call the Airline Deregulation Act, which is a statute passed in 1978 that attempted to liberalize and open up the airline industry by creating significant deregulation. Uh, as a result of that, the Supreme Court ruled in two very well-known cases in the US um, that there was what we call preemption. In the US, we have federal law and we have state law. Preemption means that a federal statute or a federal rule basically pushes aside the state law and supersedes it. And in the context of the airline industry, the ADA has been held to preempt rules relating to rates, routes, or services. And those are the two cases that are cited, the Morales case and the American Airlines case. Those were cases involving um, uh, issues relating to frequent traveler programs, or they changed the contract terms or the number of miles that you were able to get in order to get free travel. And basically what the Supreme Court said that if the issue relates to rates, now it's called prices. So we would say prices, routes, or services, it's actually preempted um, and the state can't control or legislate in those areas. Uh, let's see where my next slide is coming up. Takes a minute. There we go. So there's a third decision, um, which is the Ginsburg case, where this individual was actually part of a frequent flyer program and was kicked out because of certain complaints that he made and they, the, 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 the airline decided they didn't want him to be part of the program. And the third decision held that common law claims, which would be claims that are state based um, and that prohibited the, the ability to circumvent those claims are also preempted. So it expanded to some degree on the idea that the um, issue of rates, rules, and services um, is preempted if a state law is inconsistent uh, with that rule. Uh, the, the example in Wollins was that there was some, there was a state rule with respect to the requirement of um, advertising and the Supreme Court said you can't, the states are not allowed to over, oversight, uh, to supersede or overcome the state, the federal rules. However, with respect to preemption, there is one very big exemption. It's a very big uh, hole into which a lot of people can drive. And that is what the court referred to as private contract claims. In other words, if the airline undertook in its contractual undertaking to the passenger to do certain things, that undertaking is not preempted and that you could sue under state law for breach of contract. That's very important because we're gonna to get to that in a minute. So, that's that's the circumstances. So in summary, again, if something relates to prices, routes, or services, it's preempted by federal law. But if there's a private contractual obligation that the airline has undertaken in its conditions of travel, uh, there there is a basis for bringing a lawsuit against the airline for the breach of contract. That would not be superseded or preempted by the um, Airline Deregulation Act. So there have been a, a, a numerous class action lawsuits for refunds um, against all the major carriers, including United, Delta, Southwest, Spirit, Frontier, American, and others, as well as lawsuits against international carriers, such as Lufthansa, KLM, Air Canada, 
and others. The basic theories on which the lawsuits are being brought are, are pretty straightforward. Breach of contract, that there was some term in the contractual uh, terms of travel that was breached uh, or violated by the airline, uh, a concept we have called unjust enrichment. In other words, the airline got money uh, for something that they, were, uh, they didn't uh, provide consideration for, so they were unjustly enriched a very traditional concept called conversion, which is where you take money and you convert it, and money had and received, another kind of common law concept that you take money from someone and you receive it for no value. Those are the general theories on which most of these, uh, these lawsuits are brought. Almost all these claims are being, I'm sorry, I went too far. Almost all the claims are being brought in federal court. You know, we have a system where we have 50 states with their own legal systems and then we have the federal system um, which is uh, which has what we call limited jurisdiction in other words federal courts can only hear certain cases uh, but most of these claims are being brought in federal court under our federal class action rules um, because federal courts tend to be more sophisticated federal judges are appointed not elected, state judges tend to be elected, sometimes they're more political, um, and most people prefer federal court because it's a bit more professional not to take away from state courts. So many of these cases are in federal court under the federal class action rules, and they're generally preferred in complex cases. Um, one of the advantages to the plaintiff's bar in class action cases is that if you have a class, let's say there's 50,000 people who are claimed to be part of a class of passengers who were not allowed recovery or asked for refunds and didn't get the refunds, um, you have to give a notice to the, to the members of the class at a certain point as to the status of the case or if there's a settlement. And the cost of the notice can be very important, very significant if you have to mail notices to thousands and thousands of people. And under the class action vehicle, those costs are generally borne by the defendant. Um, in addition, if the class action counsel provides a benefit to the class, they can apply for some uh, award of legal fees, which can also be very significant. I don't know whether any of you on this, on this webinar have been involved. You'll get a little postcard in the mail that says, you know, you're. I got one recently for Netflix. That Netflix. This is the online, um, uh, t, uh, you know, movie thing. Netflix. You can rent movies and watch movies. And there was something about their their pricing. And I got an email that you know you can get a a five dollar credit for the next Netflix picture you rent. Um, but there's thousands of people. So the plaintiff's lawyers will say, well, I benefited the class because there were a million Netflix subscribers who each got a $5 benefit. So that's a $5 million benefit to the class. So I should get a big fee. That tends to be how it works. Um, there's a process for class certification, which means that the court has to actually approve the class based on certain criteria and most of the time, if a class is certified, the case is settled because if you have a small claim, let's say you're a passenger and you're claiming a thousand dollar refund on your airfare, that's not very big. But if a hundred thousand other people are making the same claim, um, that's obviously a hundred thousand times a thousand, which is a lot more money. So generally when a court approves a class, cases tend to settle. And it's a fairly long and complicated process, which can take months. Um, as mentioned above, um, the, the claims that are based on state law and relate to price, routes, or services are probably preempted, which means that you can't sue the airlines for anything relating to price, routes, or services, which I think refunds would be included in and therefore they would have to deal with the Department of Transportation uh, in some kind of administrative uh, uh, proceeding rather than in federal court. Um, 
there are cases which say that the theories of unjust enrichment and conversion relate to prices, routes, and services, and therefore are pre preempted and can't be brought in federal court. There's another theory which um, has not gotten a lot of support, but there are some cases in other areas, which is called primary jurisdiction. In other words, you heard from Rachel that the DOT has issued notices, maybe not binding regulations, but notices. So they've kind of taken action in the area with regard to um, the uh, requirement of refunds. Sorry, the phone's ringing, whatever. I am at home. So, yeah, I apologize. So since the Department of Transportation has taken certain actions, even though they're, they, they appear to not be binding, according to Rachel, there's an argument to be made that uh, the primary jurisdiction, the primary power to legislate and adjudicate in this area is with the Department of Transportation and that the courts should defer to the administrative agency. Um, that's an argument that uh, can be made and probably will be made. Um, so I think there's a good faith basis for arguing that the Department of Transportation should be dealing with these refund claims rather than the federal courts. Um, and there's another rule that if you have a Department of Transportation violation, that does not give you the right to bring a lawsuit or a private cause of action. Therefore, if that argument succeeded, um, it would just be a question of dealing with the administrative agency making a complaint before the Department of Transportation uh, rather than being in federal court, which of course would involve all the issues of class actions and legal fees. Um, However, the Department of Transportation has its own power to impose significant fines and penalties for violations of its rules and guidelines. Therefore, it's not, it's, it's, it's not something that would let the airlines completely over, off the hook, since it's likely that the, the DOT might impose fines and penalties for failing to follow um, its own guidelines. Um, again, as I mentioned, the major exposure, I think, to airlines will depend on the terms of their contracts. Some airlines, I won't go into the names, actually have in their conditions of carriage a undertaking that if a flight is canceled um, by the uh, airline as opposed to by the passenger, they will fund the, fi the, uh, the airfare. I think if there's a contractual provision like that in the contract of carriage, uh, preemption will not apply and the airline will probably uh, be required to reimburse uh, the passenger uh, again if, if the airline undertook to provide uh, refunds. Um, many airlines, uh, particularly the foreign carriers that I'm familiar with, which is Air France and KLM, have basically agreed that they will be providing refunds where refunds are requested. So a lot of these class actions may be um, rendered academic by the fact that the airlines are going to be paying the passengers back for their airfares and therefore the lawsuits will ultimately be mooted. So in conclusion, I think we're going to see uh, continued class actions because of a very aggressive plaintiff's bar looking for legal fees. Nothing wrong with legal fees, but it is something that the class action lawyers um, like to uh, raise when they bring these lawsuits. Um, I think a lot of these actions will end up being mooted because I think the general trend is for airlines to actually provide the refunds. Um, there may be some pretty good defenses involving primary jurisdiction or preemption. Um, and even if uh, an airline would succeed in getting a case dismissed in favor of a Department of Transportation investigation, uh, it may result in, in costing a lot of money to the airlines in terms of fees and penalties. Um, it just yesterday, of course, Americans are now not allowed to travel to Europe, whether that is going to affect the um, issue with respect to some kind of force majeure. If I had a ticket that I bought that's non-refundable to travel to Paris in August for vacation, which I usually do, and now I can't use it, whether the um, EU ban is going to 
affect that and create a force majeure situation um, is something that I haven't looked at yet, but is an interest. So we will see how this evolves. And hopefully one day I will be able to go back to Europe and visit Alberto and Paolo in their beautiful cities. And thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for your speech. Uh, and uh, before to start uh, with the, the last uh, speaker, I would like just to remember uh, that uh, we are collecting uh, the, the questions uh, uh, for uh, the section uh, of uh, question and answers uh, that there will be after uh, Mara's uh, presentation. So I invite the audience, uh, uh, if uh, someone uh, of you has uh, uh, questions for our speakers, uh, please uh, uh, write uh, your uh, questions uh, in uh, the section uh, of the chat uh, of this webinar. We are collecting uh, the, the, the questions uh, and uh, we will start uh, uh, after Mara, uh, the section uh, of uh, question and answer. So, uh, thank you again, uh, Chris, uh, for your speech. Uh, now, uh, the next speaker is uh, Mara Stiliano uh, from Piraeus, uh, Greece. And uh, many thanks, Mara, for being here today. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending. What the Hellenic Republic actually did was to temporarily, temporarily restrict fully or partially the country's connections, be they aviation, maritime, rail or road connections, with countries where the disease was widely dispersed. The option of vouchers to be offered by air carriers to passengers whose flights were cancelled due to these restrictive measures is not a provision that was set out by the Greek government. Rather, it is an option that air carriers have based on the explicit provisions of the EC Regulation 261 of 2004 on the rights of passengers in the event of denied boarding long delay and cancellation of flights, and specifically as provided in Article 7, Paragraph 3. In its preliminary thoughts, number 14 and 15, this regulation provides that obligations on operating air carriers should be limited or excluded in cases where an event has been caused by extraordinary circumstances which could not have been avoided even if all reasonable measures had been taken. And extraordinary circumstances should be deemed to exist where the impact of an air traffic management decision gives rise to the cancellation of one or more flights, even though all reasonable measures had been taken by the air carrier to avoid cancellations. It should be noted here. Mara, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you please uh, turn on uh, your webcam because I don't see you on the oh, screen. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Just to see you on the screen. Thank you. I'm trying to. Let's see. Otherwise, don't worry, you, we can continue. Uh, if you want. I think it's okay now. Yeah, here you are. Wonderful. Apologies. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it should be noted that pro passenger interpretation of this regulation could possibly push airlines to bankruptcy. In any case, speaking of Greece, in the case of COVID-19, it is the strategic measures taken, that is the overriding mandatory provisions issued by the Hellenic Republic for the protection of public health, that indeed 
entailed as a consequence of their imposition air traffic management decisions consisting in the cancellation of flights. Therefore, the crucial decisions referred to in the preliminary thoughts of the EC regulation 261-2004 are, in this particular case of the pandemic, taken not by the air carriers themselves, but actually by the Hellenic Republic, which by instituting a series of temporary prohibitive measures for the monitoring of the disease's expansion and the protection of public health, led to the unavoidable cancellation of all flights concerned. Thus, at least in the case of Greece, the cancellation of flights was not an explicit provision, meaning that it was not part of the imposed measures explicitly included in the relevant statutes issued, but merely it was an unavoidable consequence of these measures, which consisted inter alia in the temporary prohibition of the country's connections by sea, land, and air, imposed via acts of legislative content, and subsequently via joint ministerial decisions, as well as notams issued by the Greek Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, what I intend to clarify is that the Greek government, with its acts of legislative content, did not interfere with or regulate in any way whatsoever uh, the passengers' contracts of carriage, and of course, by no means did it enact or even propose the option of vouchers to be offered by their carriers to the affected passengers. The Hellenic Republic only declared the temporary prohibition of flights from and to a number of destinations as an urgent measure, among a series of other similar measures for the prevention sanitary monitoring and restriction of the dispersion of the disease. In order to be precise, I should once more set out that these statutes, namely acts of legislative content, did not enact flight cancellation, but enacted prohibition of connection of Greece with other countries as part of the measures taken for the protection of public health. Therefore, strictly speaking, the cancellation of flights is an unavoidable consequence of the restrictive measures passed with these acts and not one of their explicit provisions. Thus, in the case of Greece, the cancellation of flights was not a measure per se, but one of the results, one of the unavoidable consequences of the restrictive measures taken by the government. take some time to change the slides but this is why i'm pausing so okay it's okay uh, what exactly is an act of legislative content the greek constitution in its article 41 44 sorry paragraph one provides that under extraordinary circumstances of an urgent and unforeseeable necessity the president of the republic may upon proposal of the cabinet that means of the council of ministers issue acts of legislative content such acts must be submitted to the parliament for ratification within 40 days as from their issuance or within 40 days uh, as from the parliament's convocation to a session should not such acts be ratified by the parliament within three months from their submission, they will henceforth seem to be in force. So such acts are issued only in extraordinary circumstances of urgent and unforeseeable necessity. And it is under such circumstances only and following a, a proposal of the Council of Ministers that the Greek constitution authorizes the president of the Republic to issue these statutes, which are actually substantial laws, meaning that they are produced without the synergy of the parliament, which is the conveyor of legislative authority par excellence. Therefore, this is an exceptional process to which the cabinet may resort very scarcely and only if the said street requirements do actually conquer.
Where the right to bodily and mental integrity concerns the individual health of specific persons, public health refers to the cohabitation of people and to the particular risks and health problems deriving from this cohabitation. The protection of public health is a significant aspect of public interest, and as such, it allows according to explicit constitutional provisions, the restriction of specific individual rights, such as the right of free circulation and installation by imposing exit bans, lockdowns, quarantines, or other similar measures. The Greek constitution explicitly provides for the enactment of restrictive measures to the extent that this may result to the avoidance of every risk of endangerment of some other equal or superior legally protected right of a, of a legal good, let's say, such as public health, always taking under consideration the principle of proportionality. The necessity for the protection of public health from the dispersion of COVID-19 within the Greek territory was defined by the act of legislative content issued on 14 March as a case of emergency in time of peace. Earlier though, the first initiating general and as such most significant act of legislative content, which was issued on 25 February under the title Extremely Urgent Measures for the Avoidance and the Restriction of the Dissemination of the Coronavirus provided the frame and the viewpoint for all the other statutes that then followed. So this first act of legislative content was based on the constitutional provisions regarding all citizens' right to the protection of their health and the respective obligation of the Greek state to care for and promote public health. On the basis of this obligation, the government enacted special measures, namely taking under account the extremely urgent necessity to confront the imminent dangers and risks deriving from the appearance, development, and dispersal of the coronavirus. One of these measures was exactly the temporary restriction of the aerial connections with countries where there was significant dissemination of the disease. This restriction was further materialized via a series of joint ministerial decisions and via a series of notams issued by the Greek Civil Aviation Authority. And uh, may I say here that all the list of all the acts of legal content, the subsequent joint ministerial decisions and the notams issued in Greece in chronological order and with a short reference to their content is at the full disposal of any interested pa panelist or attendant of the webinar. On the other hand, within the EU, the law governing air carriage contracts of passengers is regulated by 593-2008, referred to as Rome 1, and more specifically by Article 5 of this regulation. If we are to consider as a private international law parameter, which impact might the local law at the place of destination have on the contract of carriage and as far as Greece is concerned, I would say that the local law actually does not interfere with the contract of carriage per se, that is with its provisions, terms and conditions. Instead, the only consequence of the Greek preventive and protective measures exposed is the reversible cancellation of the scheduled flight concerned. It takes some time to change the slides, so please excuse me for this. 
uh, in my opinion, the acts of legislative content that enacted these measures are indeed overriding mandatory provisions falling under Article 9, Paragraph 1 of the Rome 1 regulation. It had proceeded a little further, my slide, sorry. I'm trying to bring it back to the natural course of the presentation. Okay, here we are. Uh, merely in a theoretical, hypothetical level, it could be validly held that these measures would lawfully interfere with the relevant EU provisions on conflicts of laws. But they, um, sorry, but I would think this to make the distinction and underline that the Greek statutes discussed here do not apply to the content of carriage it itself. Thus, uh, they do not affect the applicable law. They only affect the flight's execution as they introduce more or less extended temporary prohibitions and restrictions at the point of travel, as far as travel is concerned. Therefore, although they are indeed overriding mandatory rules, as these are provided in Article 9 of Rome 1, being crucial for the country and its safeguarding and the intended overall drastic protection of public health within the Greek territory, they do not interfere with the law governing the cancelled contracts of carriage. They merely entail the unavoidable cancellation of this contract's execution. Finally, and as far as Article 9 of Rome 1 is concerned, I believe that discretion does play a role here. And in a hypothetical event that a different EU member state had actually jurisdiction to hear such a case, then the outlined Greek measures being overriding mandatory provisions would indeed render the execution of the contract of carriage unlawful. Their nature as measures of prevention and sanitary monitoring in times of an official claim pandemic, their purpose of prevention of the dispersion of the disease, the extremely urgent necessity to face all risks from the appearance and the dissemination of the virus and the consequences of their application or non-application would leave no doubt or consideration for an opposite interpretation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, oh. thank you very much, uh, Mara, for your speech, uh, for having uh, given us uh, the Greek perspective of our topic and the private international law aspect of, uh, of the, 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 the particular legislation uh, adopted in Greece. Now, uh, Alberto, uh, it's time for, uh, for questions uh, to, our, uh, to our speakers, so please, uh, uh, I know that uh, we have uh, a, a couple of questions uh, from uh, from our audience. Uh, uh, Alberto, would you like to uh, pose these questions to our uh, speakers, please? Of course, but first, uh, if you do agree, I would ask Colette to unmute all microphones so we can tribute our speakers a much deserved applause. Colette, go ahead. And thank you, thank you to all the speakers for their excellent, excellent uh, speeches. Uh, so um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one, uh, to my view, sh uh, might be addressed to Olaf. Uh, the question comes from Robert Hurst, uh, and he's asking whether uh, regulation to uh, 261 
of 2004, to which reference has been done both by him and by, by Mara, applies to UK airlines and to flights originating from a UK airport after Brexit. Olaf, what do you think to that regard? Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's always a problem to reply to what will be after Brexit questions, because the answer may be yes today and no tomorrow, and yes again the day after. Uh, so if there is no treaty stipulating for anything else, if we do uh, end up with a so-called hard Brexit, uh, then I think the answer is clearly no, because in the regulation, the wording is, this regulation shall apply to passengers departing from an airport located in the territory of a member state, capital M and capital S, to which the treaty with capital T applies. And the treaty is the treaty establishing the European community, which I guess would no longer apply if uh, we have a hard Brexit. So that would be, uh, uh, I think, rather clear. But with Brexit, you never know what we will have uh, eventually. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf. <laughs> Uh, there is another question coming from Joyce Pitcher, uh, and the question is uh, whether uh, any of the people, uh, any of the, of the panelists had heard of any successful procedures for refund of cancelled flights during COVID. Uh, let's go to your experience. And anyone of the of the panel who wishes to reply is very much welcome. Well, I'm uh, uh, I'm not sure what that means as far as successful refunds. As I said, I think many of the airlines, at least the European airlines, are um, revising. They originally were trying to push for credits, but are now adopting a refund policy um, that's true of I think uh, KLM and Air France and possibly Lufthansa as well as far as the US airlines are concerned I'm I'm not I'm not that up on that maybe Rachel knows the answer but I think the general pressure there's a lot of pressure to provide refunds if requested Rachel do you agree with that I do I think um it's early, like I mentioned, I mean, from a DOT perspective, it's unclear how that in, the, the investigations are proceeding and how that will affect successful, you know, the, achieving a successful refund if you uh, feel you are due one. But again, not, as I mentioned under US law, not everybody is automatically due a refund. It has to qualify. Um, so if you decide to cancel the flight yourself and there has not been a cancellation by the airline or a significant delay, then you likely would not be successful getting a refund. So I think it's 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 early still. Um, and again, due to the volume, it's very, um, uh, there's just so, so many uh, requests that airlines are processing these days that um, it might be too soon to tell. I myself, in my experience, had the opportunity to, to obtain, a, uh, to, to recover a refund from, uh, from an air, airline, uh, non-EU airline, but yeah, so I, I do stick with uh, the replies which were given before. Uh, uh, some try to push for vouchers, but at the end, upon, uh, if one insists, then uh, a cash refund come. Um, honestly speaking, unless you deem uh, differently, uh, Paolo, I, I guess we have gone uh, 15 minutes past the time that we originally planned for this seminar. Uh, so um, I would uh, thank very much uh, all attendees for their interest they have shown towards this event. And I would then, uh, I would invite them all to visit uh, OAS website and check our upcoming webinars. So uh, I would say to everybody, stay healthy. 
And also on behalf of Paolo, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to everyone. Uh, it has been uh, uh, really a pleasure today to stay here with you. And uh, I hope uh, to, to see you again uh, in, in the next uh, occasion in our next uh, webinars. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone and goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.